Just a few thoughts early on Saturday morning before FP3 and qualifying here at Monaco. First of all, apologies for not doing the video yesterday as I normally would after Friday practice. But as I said in a couple of live streams and I think in the conversation with Cameron last week that I did have a, a big commitment yesterday that I needed to uh, fulfill. So that being done, we're now Saturday morning and I had a little bit of a look at what was going on yesterday. Just a few thoughts on that. First is that Bear in mind, this is a long championship, and if you are in the design team of any Formula One team, you're going to be looking at the compromise over the year, as distinct from what car can we build to be really quick for Monaco. And I think what we're seeing, the issues yesterday with Red Bull, and to some extent with some of the other teams, reflect that there is a compromise involved. And if you've got a car that's as good as the Red Bull over a season, in terms of grip and balance, and the sort of sweet spot the drivers have in which to manage the tyres, and is quick on the straight, as quick as anything on the straight, if not a little bit quicker, then there are always going to be circuits, Monaco particularly, with no straights really to speak of, where it's going to be more difficult to get the car absolutely right. And I think that's what we saw at Monaco yesterday. And I think McLaren a little bit in the same class, not to the same extent, because they don't have the same extremes as Red Bull, but a little bit less competitive here probably than... Mercedes, Ferrari, maybe even Aston Martin, who haven't been as quick in a straight line, but certainly in terms of other things, they do them pretty well. So it stands to reason if you've got a car like the Ferrari, which over the winter lost a bit of top speed, but gained in terms of its, its ability to give the drivers what they need to manage the tyres, the grip, the balance, the, the traction they need, the turn in, if that compromise is reached over the winter, which it appears is the case, then Ferrari <clears throat> were always going to be in really good shape here at Monaco, as I said last week. And wonderful yesterday to see Charles Leclerc just in a class of his own, driving like all great drivers drive and look when they're in that situation, when they're just completely confident, they love the circuit, they love the situation. Everybody's working in harmony around his car, the car feels great, he can feel the surface of the road. And I think that's what we saw with Charles yesterday. Just wonderful to watch. The I think the changes they've made to the operational side of his car in terms of the race engineering, which and Jock Clear there as well, and he's been very much a part of that decision-making process with Freddie. I think that's worked really well. It seems to be a very harmonious uh, and, and very clear uh, line of communication now, which is really good in the team. And so, yeah, it's as we go into Saturday, I'd say it's Charles' race to lose. I don't think in any way we can count Red Bull out. I think they, there was a lot of talk yesterday, particularly from Max, that the car was really difficult. Sergio Perez backing it up in terms of bouncing and feeling very knife-edgy. But I think all this needs to be seen in perspective of where Red Bull were and where they are now. And most teams probably would love to have the car that Red Bull have got right now, <laughs> to put it bluntly. And, and I'm sure it'll be better today anyway. It looks like they need, as at Imola, they just need to, I guess they need to, to come up with the ride height a bit in terms of the bouncing. They need to soften it probably. And that's maybe where they're going with the car. We'll see. But I think we need to see that in the context also of where, what happened at Imola with Red Bull. Because as I said to Cameron in the piece I did with him last week, there was certainly a lot of talk in Italy around the Ferrari area that Red Bull were basically playing with everyone at Imola and they had a lot more in hand than, than they appeared to have or said they had at the time. And that, why would they do that? One, because they just, they don't want anyone saying, let's penalise Red Bull or whatever could happen in Formula One if they just win every race by a mile. That's one thing. It's unlikely to happen, but it's possible that uh, if they just win every race by a lap, something, some action may be taken. Certainly the fans would be up in, in revolt, probably. And then beyond that, I think they've been, they know it's in the interest of Formula One in general to keep things fairly tight and to keep as much information for themselves. And if they can have a few teams going down the wrong path in terms of thinking where they're going, then that's a good thing for them. So on that basis, I've since established that Max's tyres didn't fall off the cliff, as it were, at Imola. I'm not saying that he said they had either, but he certainly gave the impression that the tyres were really difficult to manage in the last third of the race. And talking to Pirelli, that isn't the case. The cars, it, it, there was a fairly linear deg on the car. The car was set up for understeer, 
which is fair enough given the changes they made overnight to get the car to work on the on the medium and the soft tire but when they got onto the hard with the understeer it would definitely uh, made the deg worse but it wasn't it wasn't something that wasn't manageable and then also there was that little business that little cameo if you like about the energy and the battery falling off that's fairly normal it's not particularly unusual and there's a lot of discussion about i think it was go to mode seven um to get around it but you will get some clipping and uh, he did he did for a couple of laps and there was a bit of clipping and it was no big deal and he still won the race and i think the philosophy was the people that are saying, well, Max is playing with us, were saying, well, you know, even as Lando was never, ever going to get past him. I mean, Oscar Piastri couldn't pass Carlos Sainz's Ferrari in DRS, remember? So there's no way Lando is going to be able to pass Max in DRS at Imola. And, and I think possibly we need to see what happened at Monaco here on Friday in that, in that vein. We'll see. Um, obviously, today's another day and the track will have gripped up a lot. And obviously it depends on getting a free lap and having no incidents. So many other variables come into play at Monaco. But assuming things are relatively clear, I can't imagine that Max isn't going to be super quick today. I'm not saying he'll, be, he'll, be, he'll beat Leclerc to the pole. He may well not, but uh, it'll be an interesting, interesting one. Mercedes looking very good at the moment. Again, there's no straight here to penalise them. And so they can really get the car set up well with high downforce and it's looking good. Lewis looking good in the car yesterday. It looked as if he was playing around with the car a lot, playing around with his driving too. I mean, I saw, I was watching him again into Tabac for a while and he looked really good into Tabac. Nice early entry, very Charles Leclerc, Max Verstappen going into Tabac. Saw a few shots um, from a distance, got to say, going into Rascas and I didn't, he just didn't look quite as Verstappen-ish going into Rascas as he, Lewis, used to look in the McLaren winning Mercedes days. And I wondered whether that, I wonder still whether or not having driven this car for two years now, constantly anticipating what it might do next or trying to anticipate on a knife edge, trying to get the tires managed and trying to do all the other things, whether or not on a, on a corner like that, which is obviously very quick approach and you got that change of direction, you're braking under load, whether he's still leaving a bit of Lewis in Lewis's world margin of just a slightly wider entry into that corner and not not going down to a sort of max rotation point because he just doesn't feel 100% confident, maybe 99% confident. Whereas in Tabac, where it's, in the, it's a more open approach, I think you know, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the old Lewis there. So that was interesting. And I thought also it was interesting when Piastri was behind um, Leclerc in, when they were at the back end of FP2, they were on medium tyres doing reasonably, not long runs, but sort of fuel runs. And he was behind him. And you could see, well, I thought you could see that he was just sort of, right, wow, I'm behind Leclerc. And, and he was luck, obviously, but following Leclerc and just watching what Leclerc was doing and staying with him for about a lap. And I thought that was really interesting because... You know, I've said that a couple of times about Piastri. He doesn't appear to be afraid to learn and to throw his ego to one side and see what these guys are doing. And I don't know whether he's ever seen Leclerc as a Max type driver, but I suspect he does now. Because that's it. I mean, it might have been Max driving the Ferrari the way he, Leclerc's driving yesterday and probably will drive for the rest of this weekend for sure. And so I thought that was good. And I say that almost if I think in the, the counterpoint would be Yuki Tsunoda, who is the ultimate sim driver, isn't he? In terms of, you know, that is what the engineers and the car and the sim and that's me and my world. And it doesn't look too much beyond that. And when he got to China where he hadn't been before and all he had was the sim, he was lost. And it's interesting because that, that, that's, people say the whole sim world has taken over and if providing you're really quick in the sim, that's bound to mean that you're gonna be good in the car. And yet he wasn't. And the sim didn't work for him there. And so what we're seeing is Piastri saying it's the nitty gritty road dusty following another driver learning that's much more important than the sim almost. I'm, I'm not putting words into anybody's mouth. I'm just making my own assumptions here, but that's what it looked like to me. And it's a really interesting reflection, I think, on where young drivers of the future are going to go because you can do the sim for so much in terms of procedural things, how to operate the car, get to know roughly the layout of the circuit, but there's nothing to beat actually 
driving the car and or getting as near as you can to driving the car with all the dynamic weights that come into it and have the perception and and and, and freedom of thought that allows you to start playing around with how you go into a corner and the platform you create into a corner and the rotation point, which I think Piastri does a lot. He thinks about that a lot, I suspect, ready to be proven wrong. Yeah, Aston Martin also falling in that category, I think, of no, no straight to penalise them and a nice drivable, balanced race car. Fernando Alonso looking very fluid in the way he was going around Monaco yesterday, looking really good. I mean, he only needs a good qualifying session by which I mean just good breaks at the right time, nice free lap in queues one to three, and you could see him right up there. You could see him even winning this Monaco Grand Prix if he was on the pole, of course. Uh, as for Carlos Sainz, he didn't get out with the music uh, with everybody else early in FP2, and he was a little bit behind it all. It looks to me like he's timing his weekend quite well, letting the track come to him. He's the sort of driver that he could, you know, the way he drives with his quite late entries and getting the power on as soon as possible, braking late. All those things could you know, lead to a bash with the guardrail, but let the track come to him, stay quiet, all the spotlights on Charles. And if you look at some of his sector times, he's pretty good sectors one and three, which are critical sectors really. It's only sector two where he was a little bit slower and that's all very slow twiddly stuff, isn't it? So I suspect Carlos won't be far away from Charles. I don't think he'll beat him, but he'll, he'll be very near him. And of course, anything could happen in terms of traffic. So when we keep saying she won't beat him and that's in the perfect situation. I'll try and do another video after qualifying and, uh, and we'll see you then. In the meantime, thanks to Jetcraft, thanks to Pitbox, thanks to OEM Exclusive, and thanks to you, the viewers. Talk to you soon. Thank you.